Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, where our job is to help you build visibility, professional credibility, and connection with your ideal client by putting the human at the center of innovative marketing so you can build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship with your ideal clients. I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm honored that you're here with me. If you haven't joined our wonderful marketing transformation community yet, go to innovabiz.co and collect your free gift as well. Do subscribe to the show and also leave a review because it helps others find us. Let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. You need to follow your train of thought to its actual destination, not just jump off at the station that you want. You know, because this is what so many people do. They start perfectly logical arguments, but they don't follow it to its end. They, they stop in, inside their comfort zone. But the pattern extends beyond their comfort zone. So if you're going to do that, if you're going to run a pattern, a train of thought, you've got to be on board for the whole ride. You've got to buy the one-way ticket to the destination because only then will you be able to see what lies outside your comfort zone and outside of your pattern. Welcome back. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. Now, if you haven't yet listened to my recent conversations with Brooke Sellis of B Squared Media and with Danny May of Lingmo, then go listen in. But only after you've listened to today's conversation, of course. I'm really excited today to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest, David Chislett. David is a creative at large. He's had a career as a journalist and publicist. He's played bass in a long line of bands, published short stories and non-fiction and poetry, as well as made documentary films. As a result of all that, he's appeared on stage over the years as a bass player, an actor, radio and TV journalist, a keynote speaker, an MC, an interview host and a workshop facilitator and trainer. David offers keynotes, training and coaching to professionals and entrepreneurs needing to find staying power and angles in a fast-changing world. David believes that everyone is inherently creative, but that not everyone has honed the right tools to make it useful to themselves. Creativity is more like breathing than people think, and at this point in our history as a race, we need it more than ever to survive the place we're in. It's a direct quote from David. In our discussion today, David talked to me about how to be always consciously present and observing without judgment. He explained that creativity is a capacity, not a talent. It's exercising the capacity that's what's important and that differentiates people that show more creative endeavor than others. And we talked about his bend, blend, break mantra of creativity. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from David Chislett. Hi, I'm your host Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz and I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today from Utrecht in the Netherlands, David Chislett, who's an entrepreneur, a speaker, writer and trainer. He helps people create value by opening minds to new ways of thinking. In fact, David is passionate about creativity. Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, David. It's a real privilege to have you as my guest. Good day, Jürgen. Thank you very much. Cool. Nice to be here. Now, you say that creativity is a capacity, not a talent, So, which is an interesting one because often you um, hear people talking about, well, I mean, I say it sometimes too because we have this exercise where we have people drawing things as part of the exercise as a way to express their thoughts. And I always tell people, well, don't worry about 
the quality of your drawing because I'm the world's worst drawer. I don't have a creative bone in my body, I often say in that, and yet that's not true, yeah. obviously. So you say it's exercising the capacity is what differentiates people that produce more creative things than those that perhaps don't. So let's start by your definition of creativity. What is that? Yeah, so I define creativity as an inhuman inhuman <laughs> inherent human capacity and it's inextric inextricably bound up with our intelligence the easiest way to talk about creativity is to refer to it as a process of joining the dots um, a lot of traditional definitions of creativity use words like original unique and having value um, and i have a bit of a problem with all of those things because as the bard himself once said, there is nothing new under the sun, mm -hmm. uh, despite also saying always something new out of Africa. But anyway, um, according to the research that many people have done a lot smarter than I am, and in particular, I draw on the work of uh, Dr. David Eagleman, who says that you know, every single creative act can be summarized as either one or a combination of three processes, either a bend, where you take an existing idea and you bend it to a new use, a blend where you take two concepts and combine them in order to get something different out of it, or a break where you disassemble a more complex idea and then use the parts in a different way. And it's very hard to look at anything that we call creative and not see one of those or two of those three processes in action. And that's why I tend to come back to when people say to me, what is creativity? I say it's a process of joining the dots. Hmm. Yeah, which is yeah. not a very satisfactory answer, but that's why everyone's been busy for 70 years with this idea of what is the definition of creativity. Yeah. Well, actually, I love the joining the dots analogy. And in fact, I love the bend, blend, break um, strategy. And, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But hmm. just talking about creativity and, and the definition of joining the dots, I mean, as a species, we are all creative. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here, right? Because the challenges that every single one of us face every day in normal day of life. Now, some of those challenges might be quite trivial, like uh, walking outside and it's cold. So then we go back and, and grab a, a jacket to put on or something like that. Now, you could argue that's creative in some ways because it's, it's changing what you're doing to take care of yourself. Um, and yes. there's, there's examples of that in terms of um, we have a saying in German, I don't know if you, um, if it translates in Dutch and, and I'll say it later on after we've recorded, but it basically says that everybody that can't adapt or change or um, come up with a new idea is lost. And, and we kind of say that when we observe somebody doing something in a completely different way. Yeah. Hmm. I think one of the, the reasons why our capacity for creativity is so underestimated is that it is so every day. Um, you know, now neuroscientists have, with the advances in, in, in science and scientific equipment have been able to monitor people's brains while they're doing particular activities. And when somebody is engaging in what we would consider to be an artistic creative act, and when someone is engaging in an act which requires problem solving or coming up with ideas, uh, the science shows that exactly the same areas of the brain light up in the same way and in the same order. In other words, on a neurological level, exactly the same thing is happening, whether you are trying to find a new road home because there are roadworks mm. or whether you are composing a sonata. <laughs> it's a bit like intelligence. It's not whether you are creative or not. It's actually how creative you are. And quite often that's blurred by which skills do you feed into the creative capacity in order to see what you get out the other side? Uh, I think a lot of the confusion goes around the skills versus the capacity. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Um, just coming back to what you said a little while ago about the bend, blend, break analogy. I love that because if you take that and say, well, can we use that and can we ask ourselves the question, can I bend something with this situation? Can I break something with this situation? Or can I blend something else in? Or can I 
take two things and blend them together, all of a sudden you have a process for um, conscious creativity, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, right now, the, the world's very busy with, with things like lean and agile. And lean and agile are classic bends. You know, mm. lean comes from the automotive industry and agile comes from the software development industry. And yet major corporations of all different uh, walks and stripes are now adopting those things. They're taking them from where they were and what they're intended to, and they're bending them into something else. And it's it's revolutionary. It's changing businesses. And that's how simple it can be. You just need to look for something that's working really well in a different context and transplant it to yours. And that is a form of creativity without a shadow of a doubt. No one else has thought of it, so it's new. <laughs> and yeah. it definitely will deliver value if you want to stick to the old definition. Mm. All right. Now, your mantra is um, rebel, reject, create. So talk to us a yeah. little bit about that and the meaning and and what what's involved in executing that. Yeah, sure. So I say rebel, reject, create, because I find that in our world, so few people think that they are creative. And yet so many people are dissatisfied with the way things uh, are in their life or in their work or, or what they observe in society around them. So in order to be able to find new things, you've got to be able to let go of the old things. I think it's a fairly intuitively uh, tactile truth that you, know, you can't have something new if you don't, first of all, let go of the old. So in order to get there, you need to rebel. You need to rebel against the rules, the way things have always been done and against the old wisdoms. And you need to say, no, wait a second, I'm going to put that aside. The second step is that you also need to liberate yourself from your own judgment and your own preconceptions and your biases. I mean, we're all biased. You've heard of confirmation bias mm -hmm. and there's racial bias and there's all sorts of things. So you need to reject those things too, because what keeps us on the tracks and doing the same stuff is not just what's around us, it's also what's within us. And once you've been able to rebel and reject, you have stepped into a space which is ambiguous and complex and there are no predefined or predetermined outcomes. And in that space, you can truly create. So that's the mechanics of the metro. Hmm. All right. Uh, so talk to me a little bit about uncertainty. You know, you talked about uh, jumping in or moving into that space of uncertainty where you um, say, okay, we, we've always done it this way, but let's put that aside. And yes, I've got this bias that says, um, I'm only seeing those things that confirm my my opinions. I'm not seeing other stuff. Uh, let's put that aside. Now, all of a sudden, all those things that I kind of hold on to that hold me up and, and worse still, maybe even a part of my identity uh, are all gone. <laughs> yeah. how, do we, how do we deal with that? You're taking that the words out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah. How do we deal with that uncertainty? You've got to practice it. it. And on that level, it is like a skill, this whole creative thing, is you've got to get used to it. You know, highly creative people are not that don't have an identity threat experience when they step into a space where they just don't know the answer, where there are apparently a lot of different answers. They are, they are accustomed to being in a space where their rational intellectual tool set doesn't deliver and they need to feel their way around. Unfortunately, because of the way the rest of us are educated and socialized and in fact employed and motivated at work and managed, we are extremely unused to stepping into that space. So we do react with fear, sometimes with anger and a sense of a loss of identity. So you've literally got to practice it. You've got to make space. And it's difficult because also part of the human intelligence machine is pattern recognition. You know, we see things a couple of times. We go, oh, okay, that's happened three or four times. That's a pattern that's going to happen. And we project that into the future. And we also have this bizarre tendency to see things as not related to other things, hmm. you know, as, as singular, discrete entities. And especially when you start moving into quantum mechanics and quantum physics, you begin to understand that actually everything is part of a system. It's all open-ended. Everything is interrelated, you know, spooky action at a distance. And as soon as you start trying to manage and control as, as if things are discrete entities, you get unexpected and undesired outcomes. 
But if you give all of that up and step into the uncertainty, it's going to take a while for you to figure out what the system is and how all the moving parts go together. Right now, we live in quite possibly the most polarized times ever, where the predominant social discourse is about right, wrong, black, right, yes, no. If you're not with me, you're against me. So in order to do what I'm suggesting, you need to de-socialize yourself and to let loose of this notion that there can only ever be binary solutions, because it's simply not true. Nothing in nature shows us that that is true. Hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, they're, they're certainly, I mean, the politicians are driving that polarization very strongly now all around the world in every country that I can see, or most, most countries. That, um, and yeah, we won't go down the political road, but I, you know, it's, I find that quite frustrating because um, whether it's politics or, and, you know, religion, I mean, people fight wars over religion, or whether it's um, culture, territorial claims where there's ethnic cleansing around cultures um people just see this black and white you know there's right and wrong but there's no in between and and that leads to these situations that are insoluble when that doesn't get replaced right so how can how can each of us take some personal responsibility and say well you know maybe i've got a strong opinion about something um, but what can i do to explore different options there or to step outside yeah. that that bias whatever that might be and and yeah. learn some other things well i think there's a couple of things you can do immediately number one is develop a longer term perspective so a, a lot of these nations where there are civil wars and ethnic cleansing uh that is happening because essentially of colonialism where the Brits and the Spanish and the French and the Germans uh, took over the Middle East and Africa and drew arbitrary straight lines in the sand to say, this is ours. Hmm. And they threw traditional enemies together in one place and separated them in another. You know, if you just have to look at what's happening in the Middle East with the Kurds, you know, there's Kurds in so many different countries. Quite clearly, there used to be a Kurd nation hmm. at some stage, and that has been splintered. And so... By understanding the greater geopolitical environment, you can start to have a little more sympathy for what's going on instead of just like going, oh, well, these guys are bad guys because they're disrupting civil order in this well-established company, uh, country. So I think getting a longer term historical perspective will always help. The second thing, and this is something that, of course, right now is difficult to do, but social media is also actively almost discouraging is to actually speak to a human being who disagrees with you. <laughs> you know, and instead of flying off the handle and trying to persuade them of how right you are, get them to try and persuade you of how right they are and listen very carefully to what they're saying and check everything. Hmm. And then think again. Yeah. You know, you need to have more dots <laughs> so that you can make new connections so that you can change the story. If you insist that you have all the dots and therefore your opinion is inviolable. I mean, that's counterintuitive. It's, it's, it's borderline irrational. There is no way that you have all the dots. Mm. It's just not physically believable. So those two things for me are imperative. Mm. Well, how can, I mean, how can we step outside our comfort zone from the point of view of, let's say, here's my set of values that, that I've held near and dear to me. And of course, it's part of my identity. Now, it doesn't mean to say that by listening to somebody else who doesn't share those values and whose opinion I don't share either, that I have to abdicate those values. But how do we step outside of that, leave that aside and say, I know you violently disagree with me on this particular issue, but how about we have a conversation that's actually deep and meaningful and yeah. perhaps contribute something to the greater good without necessarily changing our opinions because you know we it might just be part of our value set our upbringing our culture that we have those different yeah. opinions and most of the time it is just mm. because of that um and these things have become weaponized um i think first of all there's a very important concept when it comes to being human that many of us are not embracing enough 
And it's, it's sovereignty, this idea that you are a sovereign being. Because if you are a sovereign being, that implies that you are actualized, that you are responsible for yourself and for your own actions and your thoughts, and you are well acquainted with the notion of who you are, the, the beginning and the end of your identity. Now, it's very difficult to see how a sovereign being can engage in a conversation with another sovereign being and suddenly become someone else. Hmm. Um, unfortunately, the politics of the last 500 years have required us to abdicate that sense of sovereignty to the state, to the government, to the boss man, to whoever it happens to be. And so the notion of having conversations feels incredibly risky to us because it almost feels like we might be being disobedient or not listening to the boss man anymore or somehow becoming someone else because that isn't what the rules say we should do. And, and that's that's part of my rebel part of the of the, yeah. of the mantra is, you know, you've got to you've got to question everything. <laughs> and then you could ask why hmm. uh, after that. But because if you haven't, you're taking everything on spec, you're taking everything as given. And you don't have to be a conspiracy theory to know that people have hidden agendas, that there hmm. are reasons why things are stigmatized that have nothing to do with what you're being told, because it's expedient, because it's, you know, it's much easier to run a country full of people who are polarized than it is to run a country that with hugely diverse opinions. You know, one of the reasons why the Netherlands um, really struggles to make progress on some key issues is because every single government for goodness knows how long has been a coalition because there are so many parties in parliament. Mm which is stark contrast to most of the systems you see in the rest of the Western world. It's very difficult to be an autocrat when you have diversity of thought. And unfortunately, a lot of these things are fairly autocratic in the way they run out. I mean, I don't per se have a massive problem with all religions, but if you look at them objectively, quite a lot of the dictates of religions are, are pretty autocratic. You must do this, you can't do that. You're not even allowed to think about options because well, because you're naughty, right? You're not sovereign. You're you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna wander off the true path. I have a problem with that. I, <laughs> I think that's that's responsible for a lot of the issues that we as a species encounter at this stage of our civilization. Hmm. Well, I think there's you know it's it's there's dogma in all kinds of um, areas that like you mentioned, you know, we abdicate our sovereignty. And to me, coming back to what you said earlier about the, you know, what the neuroscientists have discovered, I mean, we all kind of make it up, make up our own reality anyway, right? And so... To a it, scary extent. It, yeah, yeah, it's it's what we let into our senses because there's so much information that we're bombarded with and we only let a very small part through our filters and our filters are our values, our upbringing our culture the experiences we've had and uh to then say well this tiny little bit that we let in and that shapes our view of the world which is completely different to the next person you know my wife who i live with and and have been with 30 years she probably has a completely different view of the world and yet you know we have so much in common and you take that then to the next step and say well remove somebody further out in terms of relationship and it's got to be so much different and yet we can't a lot of us can't accept that um other person another person has a different view of the world and that's okay <laughs> yeah i mean the thing for me about this is so interesting is that the assumption seems to be that if i learn something new or start acting in a different way i become a fundamentally different person and that that's a bad thing mm. so yes if you start acting differently as far as other people are concerned, you do become a different person because all they can see is what's happening on the outside. But are you less of a person or are you more? I mean, I would argue that it is a positive development. You don't leave the old person behind. You add to that person hmm. in order to become more. So in other words, it's not that you're not that person anymore. It's that you're that person plus and plus, plus, plus. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, the, the, the perception seems to be that it's you're that person less and less, and therefore you're less of of who that person is. And quite a lot of this comes from other people, right? Because we're part of their pattern. 
And if we change, that messes up with their pattern, which means they have to change the way they're thinking, which means they're possibly going to be changing, which means they're going to become someone else and they can't possibly be having that. So you're not allowed to change. <laughs> hmm. All right. Well, let's circle back a little bit more to creativity. You mentioned the word hmm. patterns there. So that, that's triggered a thought in my mind, because one of the things you said earlier on is, is connecting dots. And to me, you know, the ability to see patterns in things. I mean, often I, um, if kind of to me and I have these aha moments where I suddenly see this pattern and think well that's that's something that could fit over there and yeah and so talk to us a little bit more how can we kind of be more um what's the right word more more determined or more conscious of looking for those patterns of recognizing those patterns in one area and then uh, exploring how we might be able to use those. Yeah, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with this whole pattern recognition <laughs> thing because it's responsible for so much of what's bad in our lives where we become unthinking and mm. unconscious and we just run the pattern like it's some kind of a software program. But our ability to spot patterns where possibly none actually exist is undoubtedly what has moved human civilization forward. So... Insights and aha moments quite often are related to someone suddenly going, hang on, this pattern doesn't just go to here. It goes in through this other thing and out through, and then it comes and it's, oh, oh, hang on, but that changes everything. And then off you go. Um, so what does that require? Again, it requires a slightly bigger perspective. If you're just running the pattern, you're not really looking, you're not really present. You're just engaging in automated behavior, like walking and breathing. Um, so in order to see the bigger picture, to see what else is included in the pattern, you need to become more consciously present and observe really well what's going on. And the key factor in all creative thinking is suspending judgment. Mm. So it's not just good enough to watch. You've also got to watch without bias. You've got to say, I'm not going to draw any conclusions from this. Well, one of my favorite expressions is that you need to follow your train of thought to its actual destination, not just jump off at the station that you yeah. want. You know, Because <laughs> this is what so many people do. They start perfectly logical arguments, but they don't follow it to its end. They, they stop in, inside their comfort zone. Mm. The pattern extends beyond their comfort zone. So if you're going to do that, if you're going to run a pattern, a train of thought, you've got to be on board for the whole ride. You've got to buy the one-way ticket to the destination because only then... Will you be able to see what lies outside your comfort zone and outside of your pattern? Mm. And again, this is why people like you know, often are a bit allergic to this whole notion of creativity. It's like, oh goodness me, that sounds uncomfortable. It's, <laughs> well, yeah, but you know, there's that stupid diagram that's been circulating on social media for ages, which is a little circle over here, which says your comfort zone, and then there's the rest of the world where, where the magic happens. Yeah, outside your comfort zone for a reason. You get uncomfortable because you're growing. Hmm. Yeah, well, that's in interesting. So how do you go about, I mean, you just sort of reminded me, one of my favorite quotes is, is the one by Joseph Campbell. And I'm not sure he actually said it like this, but this is what's now attributed to him. And he says that the treasure that you seek is in, in the cave you fear to enter is the treasure that you seek. And and for me, that's a little bit like the, okay, get outside your comfort zone because that's where you'll start to connect the dots. You'll start to see some magic. Yeah. Um, so how do you go about kind of pushing through that that fear factor that, you know, okay, yeah. I've, got, I've got to jump off this, you know, to use your train analogy, I've got to jump off at this station because otherwise I'd go over the edge of the world there. Yeah. Well, you've got to make it safe. Um so if, if this is a, a, a solo pursuit, you, you've got to start off with a bunch of riders. You've got to say, I'm not necessarily changing my mind. This doesn't necessarily mean anything. Uh, I'm not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. This is a purely mental exercise or an emotional exercise. Let's just see what's out there. There's no implications. There's no ramifications. Let's go for it. In a business setting, it needs to be safe where... You know, people in authority are not allowed to exercise control or judgment, and there are no repercussions outside of the room. And it really needs to be a safe space because, you know, we are essentially stepping into the unknown. It, sure, we don't live in caves anymore, and there might not be a Tyrannosaurus Rex outside, 
but biologically we experience a similar uh, chemical reaction. So there's fear, there's trepidation, but all of that also teases your senses into high gear so that when you step outside the cave door, you're super alert for the Tyrannosaurus Rex and you start to notice stuff you wouldn't ordinarily see. So how do you make things safe for yourself? Well, one of the easiest ways is to get into the habit of doing it. Hmm. You know, physical exercise is uncomfortable for most people. But if you spend two weeks going to the gym or running around the block, by the end of the two weeks, it's like, oh, I can do this. This is all right. Actually, I'm starting to have fun. Let's go a little bit further. Hmm. And it's exactly the same with creativity. So make time, hold the space, and repeatedly go in there and do it. And run the thought experiments. You know, try and write a poem. Not because creativity is art, but because the, the act of writing a poem requires you to let go of a whole bunch of assumptions about what writing is, what you are, because you know, you're obviously not a poet, or maybe you are, hmm. and then you're going to find out. Um, you know, that's why these things like automatic drawing and the morning pages um, are such powerful exercises, because all you're doing is committing to filling the page. You're not hmm. making art, you're not saying anything important, you're just going through a mechanical process. And then your rational pattern-based mind kind of goes, oh, blah, blah, this nonsense again. <laughs> then your subconscious, unconscious mind's like, hey, hang on a second, this is interesting. And it starts smashing stuff together that your rational mind would never do. And all of a sudden, like it, interesting stuff's happening, like especially after the two weeks kind of barrier is breached. All of a sudden you're like, oh, and you're thinking about stuff that you would never have thought about before because that's what you do in this time. You know, bell rings, brain steps into ambiguity hmm. instead of the dog drooling. Right? It's, it's Pavlovian. But you've got to make the time and you've got to engage in the repetition to get through the boring, everyone's thought of this before, pattern-based stuff into where it truly gets interesting. Hmm. And turn it into a habit like your daily run. Again, these pattern things, you know, because it, when it's a habit, you're no longer thinking about uh, how you need to do the thing. You're just thinking about what you're doing. Hmm. And that always leads to more interesting stuff. Yeah. So in, in some ways, creativity is like a muscle, right? It has to be and a muscle if you don't <laughs> exercise it at atrophy. Right. And like a skill, it hits yeah. the confusion. And, and this is why a lot of big companies really struggle with innovation. Because they've got innovation factories and innovation teams. Everybody else is following the rules and going along exactly as they were before. What happens if every single person within the business had 15 minutes of every single day where they were just thinking about how things could be better? If you had 4,000 employees, you would have 4,000 brains which were becoming habituated to problem solving and ideation and stepping out of the stated boundaries of the, of the company's activity in order to, to, I don't know, project into the future in a way that might avoid predictable crises. Yeah. And then you've, then, you've, then you've got a culture of innovation, where that's allowed, where that's encouraged, and where the ideas are picked up on by management and acted on. Mm. Having a factory and a team locked in a basement somewhere is not helping anybody. Yeah, well, certainly. I mean, the risk with that is that it's kind of isolated from the rest of the organization and there's no input in terms of, um, even though, you know, we're talking about suspending judgment, but there's no input in terms of, well, where could this idea fit? Where could this idea have um, have application or what problem could that address? Or even turning around the other way and say, well, what problems are there that we're not actually talking about or haven't thought about in this new way? Right. Yeah. If you want to invent a better way to deliver beer, who do you ask? Mm. The guys who actually do the deliveries. <laughs> yeah. Not management, certainly not marketing. Mm. All right. Well, this is fabulous. I could um, go on philosophizing and questioning about creativity for ages. It's, um, I think there's lots of, um, lots of rabbit warrens we could go down here. Um, yeah. But it's probably a good point now, though, to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round. And it's a set of five questions which are designed to help our audience who are primarily uh, see themselves as innovators and leaders in their field. So the questions are designed, well, the answers hopefully will give them 
some new insights and inspire them to do something awesome as a result today. Cool. I'm confident. Yeah, good. <laughs> so what do you think the number one thing is anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Exactly what we were just discussing. Mm. Make time and hold time. And not every now and then, every week. Yeah. Actually, every day, ideally. And it doesn't have to be a lot of time. Make the time, hold the time, only do the thinking in that time. Not it, not not your accounts, not stupid meetings. Hmm. Thinking, thinking about innovation. One thing that did occur to me: How do you? Because you talked about um, ideas bubbling up from your unconscious if you practice this enough, and all of a sudden, because the comfort zone suddenly appears not as bad as you might have at first feared, um, something bubbles up from your unconscious. It, is there anything you do? to set aside that conscious mind. I mean, I, somebody said to me recently, they, they think of it as the bodyguard, right? So yeah. it's the bodyguard that's, that's saying, hey, look out, you know, um, I've, I've had a look outside. There's no Tyrannosaurus Rex. You can come outside or no, hang on, there's danger outside. Stay yeah. in there. So yeah. how do you set that aside so that the, you know, the power of the unconscious actually bubbles up because there's so much more yeah. there, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, your unconscious mind has access to literally thousands of times more information than your conscious mind. It's 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 quite scary the capacity of the unconscious mind, and hence how important it is to access it. You know, a lot of people report having their best ideas in the shower, mm. or walking the dog, or doing the ironing, or standing by the water cooler, not at their desks, not in a meeting, and there's very good reason for that. It's because in order to be able to think creatively, you have to have internal mental quiet. You have to be inwardly focused, not worrying about what's happening in the outside world. You have to be slightly happy, although it's not stressed, anxious, scared even. And you cannot try too hard because then you think too much and then you That's focus right. outwards. And, 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 and. So what you can do in order to um, get the bouncer to let you outside the door is to make sure that you manage your environment so that you can have mental quiet, so that you can be inward looking and so that you can, and so that you are slightly happy. You know, showers are amazing because, you know, you, you've showered a lot, so you don't have to try too hard. It's automatic mm -hmm. behavior. Uh, it's, it's warm, it's pleasant. So, oh, you're enjoying it. You're not thinking too much. Uh, and it's definitely making you happy. And, and, Boom, you know, stuff just starts flowing out. So the challenge, and it's different, the answer to this is different to everybody, is in your day-to-day -day life, what could you do that makes you feel the equivalent of being in the shower? Hmm. You know, for some people, it's music, cup of coffee, a particular chair, a particular view, talking to a certain colleague will, will induce this kind of state of mind. But that's the holy grail. That's what you're after. You need to be in that state of mind. So you need to observe yourself over time and notice when you start sparking and go, okay, what did I just do? Hmm. Where, where was I? Who else was there? What did it feel like? Can I reproduce that? Because me, I'm an early bird. I'm up at 5 a.m. and I'm going, woo, writing, sparking, going nuts. 3 p.m.? <laughs> <laughs> Useless. So I don't try and be innovative or creative in the afternoons. Hmm. So it requires, again, a development of self-awareness. And then when you do reserve this time, you know what to do. You know what it feels like. And you need to just fine-tune that for yourself. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. And for me, a lot of that happens when I'm out riding my bike. Now, particularly in the last few months when we've had COVID lockdown and you know, restrictions on the number of people that could get together outside even, um, I've been riding solo a lot, and that's that's kind of my happy space. And and often yeah. when I'm when I'm not having to talk to anybody else, I'm just right uh, churning out ideas. My challenge there is if I'm out for an hour or two hour ride, I come back and I, I know I had seven ideas, but <laughs> trying to remember the the first two or three, I can usually remember about three to four <laughs> yeah. But, yeah happens to me when i run exactly the same thing and generally when i'm at the furthest point away from home <laughs> um, but when you're cycling you could have your your, your bluetooth headset in mm. and you could you could do a voice recording you could just speak it yeah yes that's right and i then, need, need to learn how to do that 
Ah. Mm. Um, but what I wanted to say was, so when you've, when you've perfected the art of getting into the creative mindset and you've reserved your time, then what you do is rationally, before you step into that space, set the challenge. Mm. What, what do I need to have ideas about? What is the problem I need to solve? What's the process that's not working? We need a better answer. Um, whatever it is. And then your unconscious mind will go to work while you're on the bike, while yeah. walking the dog or doing yeah. the ironing or what have you. Yeah, I, and love, incidentally, I love that. And yeah. I heard, heard something the other day, and it may well have been one of your podcasts that I listened to, about um, thinking about a problem that you're having or something that you need to address just before you go to bed. And then... I was just about to add that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, <laughs> oh, it did come from you. <laughs> yeah, because what, it, what are your dreams? Hmm. It would appear, the research, that your dreams is your unconscious mind sorting through all your experiences and knowledge uh, for various reasons. You know, defragging the hard drive. There's a whole chemical bath process which goes on, which has got a lot to do with your long and short-term memory. There's all sorts of crazy stuff going on. But as you know from your dreams, what your unconscious mind is also doing is jamming stuff together that has no business being together. <laughs> That's right. Like, truly psychedelic stuff. You're like, whoa, what the hell did I just dream about? You were asking about how do you break the pattern? There's yeah. a good example. Mm. Yeah, it's your, your unconscious mind doesn't have any restrictions like your conscious logic, rationality bound day to day mind does. So it just gets up to all sorts of crazy ass nonsense. And that's quite often when you come up with the good stuff. Mm. All right. Now, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? <sighs> Reading without a shadow of a doubt, um, and not reading about creativity, although, of course, I have done a fair amount of that, but, mm. you know, reading psychology, reading history. Um, I've just finished an amazing book called How to Do Nothing, which is all about escaping the attention economy, mm. uh, i.e. social media. Um, I'm busy reading a book about the art of gathering. Um, I've read books about neuroscience, about what consciousness is and where it comes from. You know, I have a... a, a a, a little saying which I repeat to anybody who cares to listen that nothing you have ever done or learned is wasted. You might not know how you're going to use it mm. right now, but sooner or later you're going to get in a situation like, oh, <laughs> look at that. I actually know that. And whoops, out it comes. Um, acquiring dots is part of the lifestyle of a highly creative thinker. You are constantly hungry. It's quite similar to Carol Dweck's growth mindset where you're always asking how did they do that i didn't get that result what did they do differently what do they know that i don't know instead of going oh i'm just not that kind of person i can't do that having a fixed mindset engaging in the idea that this is my identity and therefore i cannot whereas a growth mindset person goes hmm why can't i do that let me fix it um and creative thinkers quite often are instinctively growth mindset orientated so for me, the best thing I've ever done for developing new ideas is, is acquiring as many dots as I possibly can from across the board. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I, I think um, for me, you know, having that constant curiosity is, is part of, I mean, it's almost part of my identity. So it's always, you know, I see yeah. something new and, oh, why is that? Or what's going on there? Or how can, right, I, right. how can I rationalize that? How can I understand that? And then, you know, asking questions like that and digging into it and that that of course opens up the possibility of reading things related to a new area or um and right. and this is where the internet's wonderful these days isn't it because you see something or you wonder about it and say okay i've got access to this global library i can kind of dig into this some more yep hmm. yeah exactly okay well speaking of the internet do you have a favorite resource you use most often sure I mean, flippantly, I want to say, yes, my brain. <laughs> um, <laughs> I actually, weirdly enough, I work really well under prompts or briefs. So, you know, in theory, I can sit and come up with ideas about almost anything. But if you give me a particular challenge, and so I quite like people to do that to me if they're like, I, one of the things that I offer as a professional is what I call unsticking sessions. So the idea is that someone comes along and says, oh, I'm stuck. And then they tell me what the situation is. And then I'm like, okay, well, have you thought about this? And I, and I start connecting the dots and seeing patterns and based on my experience of things, which, you know, is quantitatively and qualitatively absolutely meaningless, except for the context it provides the other person. So that's one of my favorite tools is, is that kind of just, 
going with the flow and extrapolating from one set of experience uh, to another without really worrying too much about whether they're actually related. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I love doing that too. And it's, it, in some ways, it's really just providing a different perspective, isn't it? And, and the ability to ask good questions is, is key to doing that, I would imagine. That's, yeah. That's what I think anyway. Yeah. Although maybe my favorite tool for innovation is, the, is one question. Why? Yeah. <laughs> and then again, why? Mm. And why is that true? And then why is that? You know, I mean, you know, we all know the five whys, but it's mm. wow, that is a tool because sooner or later you're gonna you're gonna punch through what people want to talk about that they feel is socially acceptable into what they believe and what they feel and what they feel is not socially acceptable, and then you get to the good stuff. Mm. Mm. Well, I, I've been reading some books on on fabulous questions recently, and there was one, and I can't remember which one. That, this is, I think it might have been um, Will Wise and Chad Littlefield, and I can't remember the exact title right now, but um, it's something along the lines of asking powerful questions. And their contention is that the why question is almost like a closed question. And they're saying, you know, do a lot more what or how. So what what does that mean for you or what what or how does that make you feel and those kind of questions that get people talking a lot more about what's going on for them so i'm i'm exploring that a little bit it's an interesting um interesting approach yeah i like that because then you're constantly shifting the focus which is also making it difficult for the person to stick to their established point of view mm. If I constantly ask you why, you know, I'm asking you about your motivations and your purpose. If I suddenly say, what does that look like? You're like, oh, uh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> which might result in something unexpected. Yeah, I'm, mm. yeah all right. Or what, like that. or what if that weren't true? You know, they're, they're kind of the ones that they, they bypass. They're, they're talking about the unconscious mind because immediately it's like, you know, think of the purple elephant. Uh, no, don't think of the purple elephant. And what do you think of? You're obviously going to think of the purple elephant. So it's kind yeah. of... Um, basically getting them to consider a different one if you use that kind of what if so hmm. yeah. i like what if that's also a really good tool yeah yeah all right now what's the best way to keep a client on track to make sure they're invested um so it's not you as an external consultant popping up and saying here's the magical stuff <laughs> that you are involved in a collaboration and a co-creation so that they are emotionally politically economically and structurally invested in the process because anyway, any any solution that I may bring to the party is not going to stick in quite the same way as a solution generated by someone who is intimately involved with the problem on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. Yeah, so lots of communication to build that collaboration and co-create. Yeah, and, and make sure that it actually is co-creation, that they're not just in the room with you when it's happening, but mm. they are actually doing some of the heavy lifting as well. Mm. They may not think they can do it when it comes to creative thought and innovation, but really they can. Yeah. They really, we all can. We just That's right. we need to be... Discussed that at length, yeah. haven't we? <laughs> exactly. Mm. Yeah, we're not going to go there again. <laughs> okay, well, great. Um, now, what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Be yourself. Be yourself, <laughs> Yeah, simple authenticity. You know, mm. people bang on about this all the time. It's like, oh, well, we're all unique human beings. It's like, well, yes, then maybe we should behave like we're unique instead mm. of trying to conform to all sorts of these ludicrous standards. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just let it all hang out. You know, it's, I mean, if you've ever read advice on how to get more engagement on LinkedIn, you'll see the number one thing is that people respond to actual human sharing, actual like, wow, this is how I felt. This is what really happened. Instead of these blithe, like, rah, rah statements. Mm. And it does, it works because, because you're not trying too hard. Yeah. You're just being. So yeah, That's be yourself, right. simple. And I mean, I think the, one of the, cause you mentioned early on in our conversation today about um i can't remember the term you use now but about having the self-confidence to kind of be you know we, we are a sovereign being and yeah and i can sovereignty. be i can be confident in that um and i can listen to somebody else's contrary point of view because i'm confident in my own sovereignty and it's the same in terms of being myself somebody else might say well if you want to be x 
you have to do Y. And I'm, well, Y goes against the grain for me. So I'm going to do Z, right? Now, if I'm confident in my own sovereignty, well, doing Z is fine and I'll probably make it work and still get X. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, I mean, of course, it's slightly more complicated than that mm. because maybe you are mistaken. Um, but in, in essence, yes, that, that is it. <laughs> mm. All right. Well, fabulous. Now, thanks for all of that, David. Now, where can people reach out, find out more about you and learn more about what you do and maybe even reach out and say thanks for what you've shared today? Cool. Uh, very easy. Um, my, my home on the interweb is davidchislett.com. Chislett is spelled with two Ts at the end. Um, I've got loads of blog articles and, and resources on there that you can access. But if you are really interested in learning more about creative process and, and, and playing around with it, I also am the co-founder of an event called the Playful Creative Summit, and that's just playfulcreativesummit.com. And that takes place in April every year, this next year from the 21st. And there we've got speakers from all around the world talking about games, gamification, play, creativity, creative thinking skills, and so on and so on. So it's a massive free resource for anybody who wants to skill up in this area. Mm. All right. Well, we'll have links to all of that in the show notes. So is that an in-person event or um, not sure no. yet? <laughs> no. Well, the weird thing about the, the summit is that we conceived it in uh, September 2019 before Corona hit. Mm. And we conceived it as a purely digital pre-recorded event. Mm. And the first one happened this year, literally three weeks after the first lockdowns uh, were initiated. And now we're planning for next year with the idea that we want to now start adding interactive live events as well. But the majority of the program is pre-recorded and it's all online. And that means that you don't have to be online at 2 a.m. Central European time in order to catch your favorite speaker. You can log on wherever you are in the world, whenever you want during that day and watch what you want to watch. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a, a great way to do it, I think, particularly for online events. All right. Yeah. Now, um, do you have any parting advice for our listener today? At the risk of being sued by Nike, just do it. <laughs> I think we have a cultural malaise against starting. Mm. It, we, we're we all so scared of starting. But as soon as you start, everything changes. And then you'll be amazed at what's possible. So just, just get out there. Just try. Take the first small step. Mm. Great. I love it. Okay. And um, finally, who else should I need? Should I get on the podcast and why? Well, I, I think my, my partner in the summit is an awesome person to speak to, uh, Alia Sandovar. She is a gamification expert and game designer, and she has a PhD in gaming. Mm. Um, and she's got this amazing take on the idea of the entire world as actually a game that may or may not have been designed by somebody out there or something out there. <laughs> And so when it comes to innovation and business solutions, she's got some pretty startling answers, which really get the thought juices flowing. All right. Well, it sounds fascinating. It could be a totally different perspective on yeah. innovation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we'll get an a intro to Alia from you and reach out to her and see wh when we can bring her on the show. Awesome. That would be great. Well, thanks so much, David, for sharing your time and your insights so generously with us today. I've really enjoyed this. We've uh, had a lot of fun exploring all kinds of things, creativity, how that plays into innovation, what's wrong with the world in terms of politics and religion, and, and among other things, um, but, but certainly um, lots of creative ideas for people to explore their creativity some more. So thanks, Excellent. thanks for sharing all that with me, and I wish you all the best for the future, and let's stay in touch. Awesome. Jürgen, thank you so much for having me on the show. It's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed that engaging and really informative conversation with David, full of creativity and took something away from his episode. I love David's belief that we all have the capacity for creativity and that we should make time to exercise that capacity and build that creativity muscle. I'd love to know what you took away from David's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash David Chislett. That is D-A-V-I-D-C-H-I-S-L-E-T-T. -T. 
all lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash David Chislett. You'll also find contact information there for getting in touch with David, as well as links to his website, his social media pages, and the other resources we spoke about in our conversation today. If you like this episode, please do share it with two other people that it might help. You're really doing them a favor by sharing this wonderful conversation with David. Now, as a thank you, if you tag me in that share, I will reach out to you with a special surprise. David suggested that we have a conversation with Alia Sandovar on a future InnovaBuzz podcast episode. So Alia, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the InnovaBuzz podcast, courtesy of David Chislett. Tune in again to the next episodes of the InnovaBuzz podcast. We've got even more fantastic guests lined up. They keep coming out of the woodwork. Fantastic guests including co-author of the book New to Big, David Kidder of Bionic, and customer and employee experience advocate, Jason Bradshaw. Thanks for listening to this episode. Make sure you subscribe to the show to be reminded of new episodes. It's free to subscribe. Leave a review if you like. Even if you don't like me, I'm okay with that. I'm asking you to leave a review because it helps other people find this show. Go to innovabiz.co to join our marketing transformation community and access a free gift my team and I made for you. It's the Marketing Master Mini Class. We want to give you everything you need to transform your marketing into a human-centered, relationship-focused growth engine. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating.